have a bit of a sore throat today, you guys, so bother, just bear with me if I take a little sip of water here. All right. I'm going to come up here because the video gentlemen tell me that it's better if I stand here versus behind the podium. So uh, thank you for letting me be here today. I want to thank the House Rabbit Society for the opportunity. It is a pleasure. As Benita said, my name is Kimberly Elman. I'm manager of National Outreach Volunteer Programs at Best Friends Animal Society. We're going to talk a little bit about best practices and volunteer engagement and management today. So let's get started. Lindy, with the next slide, please. So by show of hands, has anybody ever felt like this poor hamster? Right? Okay, I'm going to raise my hand too. So I think everybody in the room has raised their hand, right? So in my current role, as Benita said, I work with our rescue and shelter partners and I consult with them to help design and create better volunteer programs and better engage their volunteers. And what I frequently see is that although many of these groups are very well intended, what they continue to do is do all of the work virtually by themselves instead of recruiting and retaining enough volunteers to make forward progress to drive their life saving <coughs> missions. The good news is, if you feel like this hamster, the things we're going to talk about today will be able to allow you to change the future. But the first thing that we need to do before we can change the future and move in a positive direction is to acknowledge the truth. My director of volunteer and visitor experience at Best Friends, Patty Hegwood, has a quote that I frequently like to use. And she reminds us all the time that sometimes you have to slow down in order to go fast. And I know in animal welfare, that's a really hard concept, right? Because we're saving lives and we're moving very fast. But sometimes you have to slow down in order to go fast. And so if what you're doing currently is not working for your organization or for your volunteers and your volunteer program, maybe it's time to start slowing down. So let's talk a little bit about best practices around recruitment, onboarding and training, and sustaining engagement with volunteers. And these are all things that we employ at Best Friends Animal Society, both at our sanctuary in Kanab, as well as with our national and our regional volunteer programs. Lindy, next slide, please. Okay, before I talk about recruitment, I just want to get a feel by show of hands. How many of you have a dedicated volunteer coordinator on your team that routinely interacts with volunteers? It's not somebody who splits duty between rabbit care and volunteers. How many have a dedicated volunteer coordinator? Okay, nice job. Congratulations, guys. All right, successful recruitment. Next slide. So there are several rules or best practices to successful volunteer recruitment. Quick, please. So rule of best practice number one is the best recruitment strategy is to have happy and enthusiastic volunteers. Everyone wants to belong to a winning team. That is just a basic in human psychology. And so you want to make sure that your volunteers are happy and enthusiastic because if they are, they will recruit other volunteers for you. According to the Corporation for National and Community Service, only 25.3% of Americans are volunteering. So with just one in four adults giving of their free time, it is more important than ever that we not only effectively recruit them, but we retain and engage them. So how do you do that? How do you have happy and enthusiastic volunteers? There was a study done by the TCC group called the Core Capacities Assessment Tool. And this was an online survey where they asked 652 nonprofits and I do want to be clear, these just weren't animal welfare nonprofits. They were nonprofits from a variety of social services across the nonprofit sector. But they asked the 652 groups to take a survey and they rated them on four core capacities leadership, adaptability, management, and technical capabilities. And they assessed each of their organization's culture. And what they found is the nonprofits that are most effective in engaging and retaining their volunteers are operating as what we call a service enterprise. And a service enterprise is an organization that fundamentally leverages volunteers across all levels of their organization, and that even includes executive levels, so that they can drive and achieve their social mission. Now, unfortunately, out of the 652 nonprofits that were surveyed, 
less than 15% were operating as service enterprises. Okay, so what that means is over 85% still have room for improvement when it comes to engaging their volunteers. So there were several characteristics that all of these service enterprises had in common. And the three that I want to point out today, because they are the most vital to being successful with volunteers, is to have strategic planning and development for your volunteer program. That's number one. Number two is to offer effective training. And that is not just effective training for volunteers. That means effective training for your staff. Because let's be honest, a lot of us get into animal welfare because we prefer animals over people, right? Okay? But guess what, folks? We're in the people business, too. Because if the animals and the rabbits could save themselves, none of us would be here today, right? I'd be out of a job for certain. And then the third vital characteristic is leadership support. Meaning that your executive team understands that it's not, that volunteers are not just something that are nice to have, but they are integral to achieving your social mission and to life-saving programs. One other thing I want to point out, and that's, so that is how you get happy and enthusiastic volunteers. And one other thing I want to point out is that the research also shows that volunteers are almost twice as likely to donate to a nonprofit as non-volunteers. So when you have happy and enthusiastic volunteers, not only do you have more hands to help you save more lives, you also increase your donor relationships. So think about that when you're recruiting volunteers. Next slide, please. Okay, and you can click again. So rule number two, don't do any recruiting until you are ready to give your volunteers a quality experience. This goes back to vital characteristic number one, strategic planning and development. I'm going to be very honest, it takes time and effort to create the infrastructure for a well-designed and well-run program. And again, I realize time is a precious commodity in animal welfare. But if you've heard the expression, if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got, right? So if you want to do things different, find the time to strategically plan and develop a well-rounded program. I can tell you at Best Friends, all of us in the volunteer department, whether we're based at the sanctuary or we're remote like me because we do national initiatives or we're in regional program cities like in Salt Lake or Los Angeles, we all take an inordinate amount of time to really plan and create a solid foundation for our volunteer programs and each life-saving initiative. If you take the moment, a moment to think about it, None of us are going to live in a house that isn't built on a secure foundation, right? It's just not safe, right? So why should your organization or your volunteer programs really be built any differently? And I'm about to date myself here a little bit, but I like to use analogies, as you'll see throughout the presentation. And if any of you are familiar with Kevin Costner's movie, Field of Dreams, does anybody remember that movie? Okay, good, good. We're all in the same uh, genre. Um, there is a very famous line in that movie where it's, he's, he's told, if you build it, they will come. That's exactly what I'm asking you to do. Build a solid, well-rounded volunteer program, create a successful recruitment plan, implement effective onboarding and training for new volunteers, and create sustaining engagement. And I promise you, if you do that, they will not only come, but they will stay, and they will bring other volunteers with them. Okay, put that again, please, Lenny. So rule number three, be clear about what you need. Again, this is a part of planning and development. Please don't send out a recruitment email or make an announcement that says, we need volunteers. Because then people show up and they go, now great, what do you want me to do? Think about, again, as part of planning and development, be very specific about what your critical needs are and how you want to employ volunteers to assist you with those critical needs. Position descriptions, written position descriptions, are an excellent way to be very specific about what you need. And we're gonna talk more about written position descriptions in a few minutes. You don't wanna overwhelm when you're being clear about what you need. In a recruitment email, it doesn't need to be a page or two long. Usually our recruitment emails are about two to three paragraphs in length, in length. And then we attach a link to the position description so that if people are interested after they've read those couple of paragraphs, 
they can click for more information. Okay, next slide, please. Rule number four, don't recruit more volunteers than you can actually use. This is one of the fastest ways to lose volunteers. They are giving of their free time. Please do not have them show up and they are waiting for long periods of time for instructions or who they're gonna be reporting to or a particular resource you need to provide them so they can get started. And please make sure they have enough to do while they're volunteering. They do not like to stand around. They won't always tell you that, but they will absolutely leave and not come back if you do not make effective use of their time. Okay, next slide. Rule number five, ask people directly in person if possible. So I realize with technology today, it's very easy to send out emails asking for assistance to recruit volunteers. And we do quite a bit of that at Best Friends. Um, we are currently running an emergency shelter in Houston for displaced pets um, due to Harvey. And we actually had a few rabbits there, by the way. They were hiding out with the cats because <laughs> it was quieter than being with the dogs. Um, but although we do send out recruitment emails to hundreds of people, we always do try to ask in person or over the phone whenever possible. So if I've worked with volunteers and I see a particular opportunity where we have a need and I think of that person automatically, I will pick up the phone or I will send them an individual email and I will say, hey, I have this opportunity and I thought of you and I thought you would be perfect for it. Here's the written position description, take a look at it, and then let's chat two-way about whether or not you feel this is a good fit for you. So again, I realize you cannot always do that, but whenever possible, please try to ask people directly. Word of mouth is still best, the best form of advertising and the best form of recruiting. Next slide. Rule number six, make it easy to get started. How do volunteers hear about opportunities with your organization? Is it obvious from the homepage of your website about what they need to click to get more information to sign up to volunteer? What about social media? Do you post volunteer opportunities on your Facebook page or on your Twitter account? And how do they find those in a sea of thousands of Facebook posts and pages they're looking at daily? You don't want them to, you want to strike while the iron is hot and you don't want to take too long to get volunteers started. So when they email you or they fill out an application, you want to move them along through onboarding as quickly as you possibly can based on your staff capacity. And I'll give you a real world example of this. So I work with a municipal shelter whose city requires them that before a volunteer can even show up at the shelter for orientation, they are required to fill out an application, go through fingerprinting, and do a background check. This entire process from the time they fill out the application to the time they can actually show up on shelter grounds to attend orientation takes two months. Oh, gosh. Yes, and the shelter cannot get around this. This is the city's laws. So what do you think the retention rate is by the time those prospective volunteers have waited two months and they get to orientation? It is less than 40% and it dwindles from there as they move into training and completing training and coming back to the shelter to volunteer. So please make sure you are making it easy for prospective volunteers to get started and onboarding them as quickly as possible. Rule number seven, create community ambassadors. So when you recruit volunteers, not everyone you ask to come and volunteer will be able to do so for a variety of reasons. It's not the right fit for them. They have family or personal or professional commitments. Um, they have too many other things on their plate. So I don't anticipate that everyone you solicit will be able to volunteer. But you should view volunteer recruitment, even for those that cannot volunteer, as an opportunity to create community ambassadors in your own backyard for your organization. So you might want to include a little tagline in your recruitment email such as, aren't able to volunteer at this time? Click here for more information on how to get started or how else you can help. Or consider fostering or adopting or donating or telling your employer about us. So the whole purpose is not only to recruit more volunteers, but it's to create community ambassadors in your own backyard so people feel positively about your organization, your mission, and your brand, 
and they will be a spokesperson for your organization with others so that you can do more. Next slide, please. All right, let's talk a little bit about written position descriptions. I'm going to take a quick sip of water, but by show of hands. Raise your hand if your organization utilizes written volunteer position descriptions. All right, I see a few hands. That makes me very happy. Okay. So for those of you that do not use written position descriptions, I am not saying this to beat you up, but we're talking about best practices in volunteer management and engagement. And written position descriptions for each opportunity you have for volunteers is the hallmark of any well-run and successful volunteer program. Would you take a job as a prospective employee without reading a job description first? Right? So why should a volunteer take on an opportunity without having a sense of what you are asking them to do? Written position descriptions will allow volunteers to decide up front before you or they invest any time. Again, time being a precious commodity. Uh, you know, they'll decide before you or they invest any time on whether or not that opportunity is a good fit for them. If you want to match the right volunteers to the right opportunities, use written position descriptions, and you'll be successful doing this at least 80% of the time. Because when volunteers read these descriptions, they're either going to self-select the opportunity or they're going to opt out because they know it is not a good fit for them. So what you see on the slide here is the template that we use at Best Friends for our position descriptions. We write them exactly the same, so they are very consistent, regardless of what department um, we are using these position descriptions in. And so I'll just step you through the subcategories. So position name, you obviously want to let them know what the opportunity is. What is the function of that opportunity? So if you are looking for an adoption assistant volunteer, the function would be to answer questions for prospective adopters, show them various rabbits, and if they have a good match, processing the appropriate paperwork to find that rabbit a forever home. That's your function, and again, you don't have to say it exactly like I did it, say it in your own words, but you wanna give them in a sentence or two an overview of what you're asking them to do. We then include an impact statement right behind the function, and the impact is what ties that function to your life-saving mission. So in addition to that function statement, we would then say something like, our goal for 2017 is to adopt out an additional 200 rabbits into forever loving homes. You want to have that volunteer tie the function that you're asking them to do to your mission. You can't always assume, even if you know what the mission and the impact of the mission is, you can't always assume that volunteers will know. So, Go ahead and clearly define it for them. Because communicating impact, and we'll talk more about this later, helps keep volunteers committed to your cause and the projects you're asking them to take on. Who will they be reporting to? They do, they do want to know that. What is the time commitment and the location of that work? Is it remote? Is it at your facility? Is it an off-site adoption event? Be really specific about the time commitment. If you want them to volunteer in this capacity, six hours a month at a minimum, tell them. If you want them to do this every Saturday and Sunday, let them know. Again, if they can't meet that requirement, they're not going to select this opportunity because you've been specific in the position description. What are the core responsibilities? Just like you'd write a job description for a prospective employee. Five, six, seven bullet points about what the core responsibilities are and then qualifications and requirements. Do they need to complete a specific training before they can take on this opportunity? Do they need to be a certain age? Make sure you indicate age requirements. Do they need to have certain physical requirements, like being able to stand for three or four hours at a time, being able to bend, stoop, hike, kneel, and lift up to 20 pounds? Do they need to have customer service experience? Again, if you put all of this in the position description, they're going to read it and decide, yes, I can do that, or no, I can't, before you onboard them. And also include, uh, again, like I said, any qualifications, so if there's any particular certification, you want to mention that as well. I like to put my initials and the date 
at the bottom of the position description because I will update these periodically. We make some adjustments and this way I can go back in and I can see when the last time I updated the version is. I'll update that position description and then I'll change the date and that's how we keep track of what the latest versions are. So who should be responsible for writing these position descriptions? Should it be the volunteer coordinator? Okay, I'm hearing, I'm seeing some heads and right, who should it be? Absolutely, yes, I wish I had a prize. The person, you get, yeah, you get a free rabbit, how's that? Because you need another one of those. Um, yes, the person who performs a particular role on your team that they will be reporting to should write the position description because they know better than your volunteer coordinator what they want those volunteers to do. Your volunteer coordinator is more of kind of a general volunteer project manager, right? But you have the person they're reporting to write the position description. Now, we used to go around at Best Friends and we used to say to our various departments, so, do you need any volunteers? Can volunteers help you? And half the time we'd get yes, and the other half the time we'd be like, no, there's nothing for them to do. We figured out that wasn't a very effective way to ask about volunteers. So what we do now is, we bring them a position description with a blank template, and we say to the department manager, at your next staff meeting, poll your staff, and, and as a team, come up with one or two dream jobs that a volunteer can do for your department that would free up your staff's time to do things they are uniquely qualified and you hired them to do. So what is it that is taking a lot of their time away from why we hired them? And can we create a position description to find, and then find volunteers to fill that opportunity? And guess what? Every time we approach it that way, I get at least one or two job descriptions, okay? Um, and that's true for every network partner I've worked with. I was just at a big shelter um, last week in Philadelphia, and we had meetings with every department because they're redoing their volunteer program. And every department, when we posed the question in advance, was able to come to the meeting with one or two dream jobs. So that's the way you approach your team, particularly if they're not interested in working with volunteers. Okay, next slide, please. So where can you find volunteers? You see, I highlighted the first one in orange. Your volunteers are always the most effective recruiting source you have. If you are not, and it's free, if you are not asking your volunteers to bring other volunteers to your organization, please begin doing so. If you have a reliable and regular volunteer and you ask them, they will bring other reliable, regular volunteers to you. Like brings like, so make sure you're asking the volunteers who consistently perform well for you. You can also ask within your circle. Schools are an excellent recruitment source. Universities also um, oftentimes have both so, uh, social and civic organizations that require community service hours. Don't forget about veterinary schools and vet tech schools, an excellent source for recruiting volunteers. Service organizations like Rotary and Kiwanis, local clubs and groups, churches. I like to solicit local businesses because businesses can not only bring you individual volunteers, they oftentimes, particularly if they're a larger employer, will bring groups of volunteers. And what larger employers will do is match volunteer hours with dollars. So, for example, I said we're running an emergency shelter in Houston right now. And when I was there for three weeks, I had about 10 different corporate groups come through. And they brought anywhere from 10 to 20 volunteers at a time to help us walk dogs and take care of the cats and anything else we needed for the day. Those employees were still getting paid while they were volunteering, and then they were matching dollars for those volunteer hours. Employers will also participate in workplace giving events. So start to network with employers in your own backyard and recruit volunteers. Community events, community bulletin boards, animal related locations and events, and retirement communities are other excellent sources of recruitment of volunteers. Next slide. On the internet, you can look for volunteers. Number one should be your website. And again, make sure it's easy for volunteers to find out how to get started. 
when I go to your home page, at the very top of your home page, I should see at the top, it should either say volunteer, and I click there, or it should say how can you help, and then when you hover your mouse over how you can help, there should be a drop down, and it should say volunteer, so they can select volunteer, it should also say donate, okay? So make sure you're designing your websites that way. The research shows that when people search for something on Google, 89% of people never leave the first page of Google. We are a instant gratification, McDonald's mentality society. If a prospective volunteer has to take more than a minute or two to find out how to volunteer, guess what? You're probably gonna lose them, so make it easy. Social media, again, I brought this up earlier. How many of you post on Facebook page about volunteer opportunities? Nice, okay. So when you look at a, uh, an animal welfare organization's Facebook page, I don't see this often, but I love it when I do see it. So you go to the home page, and they've got, you've got your profile picture in that little square on the top left-hand corner. And then underneath that, it usually will say home, about us, oftentimes people will post events. What I see some rescue groups doing, and I would encourage you all to do, is also have a little section there that says volunteer. And then they can click that, and it will take them to a paragraph that either links to your volunteer application or links to an email address where they can volunteer. And again, if you don't have donate on the left-hand side of your homepage of your Facebook page, I would suggest also putting that. Craigslist, we do not use Craigslist at Best Friends, but I know some rescue groups that do, and it's certainly a way to recruit volunteers. I would just say, I think most of you know, Craigslist oftentimes isn't always the most positive place for animals, so if you're going to use Craigslist, that's fine, but please use it with caution. Volunteer Match, anybody familiar with volunteermatch.org? Excellent. I have to tell you, Volunteer Match is an excellent website for recruiting volunteers, volunteermatch.org. Other than our internal volunteer management system and our Best Friends website, this is the next best recruiting source for Best Friends in finding volunteers. They do have two types of accounts. They have a free account, so you can sign up for free, and they have a paid account, which is about $99 or 99 and some change for an annual uh, subscription. So go ahead and check out Volunteer Match and sign up for a free account. They also have a resource learning center and they offer free webinars and they have articles linked to volunteer engagement so you can tap into those as well. Idealist is another nonprofit website where you can match and recruit volunteers for opportunities and then LinkedIn now has, a it has an agreement with Volunteer Match. You have to have the paid Volunteer Match account though, it's not the free one where if you're looking for specific skilled volunteers, you can post that opportunity via LinkedIn and volunteer match for a nominal fee. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about skilled volunteers. Where do you find pro bono attorneys, accountants, photographers, grant writers, event planners? Where do you think the number one source is to find those skilled volunteers? Anybody want to guess? Existing volunteers, just like with general opportunities. Do you know all the professional and the personal life experiences that your volunteers have? Oftentimes the groups I work with do not. So make sure, as part of engaging volunteers, you know what their experiences are, who they're connected to in the community. This will help you find skilled volunteers. If not, again, Volunteer Match is an excellent source for skilled volunteers, we will oftentimes post a very specific opportunity um, on Volunteer Match. And then we ask people to submit a letter of interest and a resume, just like you would if you were applying for a job. I also want to point out I love Chamber of Commerce for skilled volunteers. Chamber of Commerce has a lot of different businesses that are very specific in their skill sets and what they offer the community. So tap into Chamber of Commerce too. So we do interview our skilled volunteers. So for our national conference each year, we have about five lead volunteer positions. So we have a registration lead, a hospitality lead, and then we have a couple of workshop session room leads. We don't just 
select any volunteer. Those people are asked to apply and to submit a resume, and then we actually do a phone interview with them so that we can determine that it is the right fit for them. We'll ask them questions about their resume and their experience and very strategic questions around whether or not they, they have the, the capability to perform well in these roles. It is perfectly acceptable for you to interview volunteers. I wouldn't interview general volunteers, right? You can just onboard them and provide training for what you want them to do. But when you are looking for very specific skill sets, it is perfectly acceptable to ask for a resume and set up an informational meeting. If you're looking for photographers and videographers or grant writers or graphic or web designers, ask for a sample of their work. If they're really good at what, you, at what they do, they're more than happy to show you their body of work. I can't tell you how many photographers have sent me a very large portfolio to look through, right? So don't hesitate. Again, you want to make sure they have the skill set you're looking for. And then you'd support them just as you would support any general volunteer. They already come with that specific skill. So if it's an accountant, obviously you're not going to teach them accounting. But you're going to show them what you want them to do. And then you're going to check in with them periodically to make sure that you're answering their questions and things are moving along and you're there to support them. So is that's how you recruit skilled volunteers. Next slide. Oh, go back one more, please. All right, so we've talked about successful volunteer recruitment. Let's move on to best practices in onboarding new volunteers. Next slide, Lindy. So onboarding is the process of integrating a new volunteer into your organization. And as the quote from Will Rogers on the slide says, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And he is absolutely correct. So there are four parts to onboarding. Your initial response, the orientation, the training, and then the support of new volunteers. So let's talk a little bit about the initial response. A volunteer sends an e prospective volunteer sends an email, or they fill out your application. How long does it take for you to respond? A day? A week, two weeks, a month? Do you forget to respond sometimes? I hope not, but that has happened. I've heard organizations say that's happened. So the standard rule of thumb is that you want to respond within 24 to 48 hours. Again, I know some of you are probably thinking, it's a time thing, Kimberly. I know, I understand, but I'm asking you to slow down so you can go fast later. So 24 to 48 hours, you want to strike while the iron is hot. They're excited, they want to learn more about your organization, they want to get started. Don't let that die. If you don't respond within 48 hours, chances are they're going to move on. And even worse, they're going to feel like you didn't value their offer and their time. And what type of impression does that leave in their mind about your organization and your brand? Again, we want you to build community ambassadors, and you can't build community ambassadors if you don't respond in a timely fashion. When you do respond, be very welcoming and warm and thank them and give them instructions for the next steps. Please do not beg. I've seen this happen. Oh, thank God! We're up to our ears and rabbits right now. We need you! Bring 10 people. Please don't do that. They're either going to go running as fast as they can in the opposite direction, or they're going to go, oh my gosh, what did I get myself into? You won't sustain them, okay? They won't come back. So please, you know, be like that duck where no matter how fast your legs are paddling underneath the water, it's calm and smooth from the surface, all right? So that's how you handle your initial response. Next slide, please. Okay, orientation. So there's several different ways to do orientation, and I am not going to get up here and dictate how your organizations do orientation. It's really honestly based on staffing capacity and what you have the capability of doing. So you can decide how you want to do your orientations. What I would say is it's important to be very consistent in deciding the when, the where, and the how. So are you going to orient each individual volunteer as they come through? Or are you going to do orientation in small or large groups? I'm a fan of doing them in groups, but again, because it's a time factor, right? But again, I'll let you determine what works best for your organization. How frequently do you want to do them? Once a month? Every other week? Every week? Again, you get to determine this, but remember that the more frequently you do it, 
the more opportunity people have with their busy lives to come to an orientation and learn more about volunteer opportunities. Is the location convenient and comfortable? Oftentimes, orientations are an hour to two hours. Make sure it is comfortable. Make sure they can sit. Make sure you have enough space for the people in the room. Know how many people are coming in advance. Um, and make sure the location is easy for them to find. And does the day and time accommodate people's schedules? Again, the goal is to recruit as many prospective volunteers as possible. So I would suggest, if you can, doing at least one during a weekday evening, and then some on weekends, and a nice mix of the two. But again, be consistent, so you're getting into a pattern. It's always the second Tuesday of the month, and the third Saturday of every month, um, so that people can come and work around their busy lives. Next slide, please. Now, I'm going to ask you to think a little bit out of the box today about orientation. Because traditionally, people think that orientation is the volunteer fills out an application, they come to orientation, voila, they're a volunteer. And that is not the current school of thought in volunteerism. Orientation is not the same thing as training. And believe it or not, coming to an orientation does not make that person a volunteer. Click, please. Right? So what I'm going to ask you to do is start thinking about orientations. First of all, if you don't have them, have them. But start thinking about them as an open house, more than an orientation. And if you think about when a realtor puts a house on the market and they have an open house, you get a number of people coming through that house and you get a lot of looky-loos. But does every person that came through to take a look at that home make an offer on that home? No. Some people make an offer that day, some people make an offer the next day, most people never make an offer. So I want you to start thinking about orientation as more of an open house. Next slide. The purpose of orientation is for that prospective volunteer to decide if your organization is a good fit for them. Again, this is about not wasting their time or yours in onboarding someone that won't be a long-term good fit. You want to talk about your history, your mission, and your values. You can talk about your structure. I want you to discuss the various volunteer opportunities that you have, what your critical needs are. Communicate your life-saving impact. What have you done to save rabbits in your own community? How many fosters do you have? How many rabbits are, have been adopted in the last year? Talk about impact. Make sure that that volunteer understands what's expected of them if they are to volunteer with your organization and in turn, what they can expect to get out of the volunteer experience with you. So it's not just about what you expect, but what they can get out of that experience as well. If you have a physical facility, give a tour and then answer any questions. I like to have volunteers help with orientation because number one, they can help read and they can help with paperwork, but I also like volunteers to give a personal testimonial about why they're volunteering with best friends. So that's another thing you can do. If at the end of the orientation slash open house, only 40% of your attendees sign up to volunteer, as strange as it sounds, that's a very good thing because you know that they think your organization is a good fit, and again, it's about saving you and them time. For those that do not commit to volunteering, what call to action can you give them? Again, think of your community ambassadors. These people, even if they can't volunteer, they're gonna go back out to the community. They've been educated about your group, right? They know more about your life-saving mission. They're leaving with positive feelings. So ask them for a call to action, donations, fostering, adopting, workplace giving, telling others to volunteer. So you can still ask every attendee, even if they don't volunteer, to take action on behalf of your organization. So make sure you're creating community ambassadors. Next slide. And if they stay and say, yes, I want to volunteer, have them fill out an application, if they haven't already done so, this is the best time to find out about their personal and professional experiences. This is how you find out who your skilled volunteers are and who they're connected to in the community. Lindy may have a grant writer standing right in front of her, but she's not necessarily gonna know that unless she asks. People don't always assume their professional skills are tied to your life-saving mission. 
They think of life-saving, volunteers think of life-saving in terms of direct animal handling and contact. So things like, you know, adopting, fostering, transporting. Those things, they make the connection quickly. But event planner may not make the connection. Accountant may not make the connection. Grant writer may not make the connection. Help them make that connection and find out what skills they bring to the table. Then have them choose opportunities they're interested in and sign up for training. Again, we want to move them through the onboarding process as quickly as possible. So make sure there is not a giant gap between the time they finish orientation and the time they go to training. Ideally, it should be done within a week. Next slide, please. So let's talk about training. Just like written position descriptions, you should have position-specific training. It's okay to do general training if you feel that it's necessary, but I see a lot of organizations make volunteers do dog handling training as part of their general training, and those volunteers have no intention of ever walking dogs. So it's not a good use of their time. So offer position-specific training, just like specific position descriptions. As this lovely lady said earlier, who should create and deliver training content? The person who performs in the role and function that they'll be reporting to, okay? Where do you want to conduct the training? Think about that. Where will you offer the training? How will you do the training? Classroom or hands-on or both? And what information do you need to include? Create a training outline just as you would train a new employee. It's exactly the same. Set the volunteers up for success. Next slide. And then lastly, you want to support volunteers. You want to make sure your new volunteers know who to go to with questions. Tell them that when they leave training. Otherwise, they'll be standing around, and if people are busy, they'll be like, should I say something, or should I? So you usually get two types of volunteers. You get volunteers who ask a lot of questions, right? Or you get volunteers that are afraid to ask questions. So make sure they know who they can go to with questions. Prepare your staff or your teams, if you don't have paid staff, to work with volunteers. Again, going back to the fact that a lot of us get into animal welfare because we like the animals more than the people, you can't effectively support and engage volunteers if your staff don't receive them well. If I have a question for Lindy and I approach Lindy as a new volunteer and she's short and curt with me in her answer or she sounds annoyed, do you think I'm going to want to come back and volunteer? Or if Lindy comes to me and I'm a staff member with questions and I might be smiling and I might have a really pleasant voice, but my arms are crossed and I'm tapping my foot and I'm cocking my head, what nonverbal cues am I sending that new volunteer? So you want to watch your verbal and your nonverbal cues, and you want to make sure you provide some training to your staff so they know how to effectively interact with volunteers. I like to pair up new volunteers with mentors. This is an excellent way to use tenured volunteers, right? It frees up staff time. So after a new volunteer comes out of training, have them shadow with an experienced volunteer in whatever opportunity. This not only creates a little bit of a social environment so the volunteers get to know each other, because let's be honest, volunteers are there for the animals, but they like the social interaction too. So give them that opportunity to develop that social interaction, and at the same time, that mentor volunteer can show them what to do properly, so you're setting them up for success and they'll come back. Provide job aids. There is no volunteer unless they have a photographic memory that's going to remember every single thing you teach them in training. So I like to create handouts that you can give volunteers to take with them. I also like to create visual aids, and I'll give you an example. So if you have volunteers cleaning cages, right, and you want the cages cleaned a certain way, you can give them written instructions, and then what you can do is you can take pictures of the entire process of cleaning, step one, step two, step three, and you post them on the wall so that they can actually have a visual as they're going along. And when they're done cleaning, if you want your supply cabinet stocked in a certain way, then take a picture of what the supply cabinet should look like. You know, paper towels go here, you know, bleach goes here, et cetera, and so on. So create visual and written job aids to set volunteers up for success. And then lastly, you want to check in frequently with new volunteers. Ask them at the end of their first day, how was your volunteer experience? Did you enjoy yourself? Did you feel that we provided you adequate training and support to do your job well today? 
Are you coming back? We want you to come back. What can we do differently to assist you? Be open to their feedback because even if it's constructive, that's where you know where that's how you know where you stand and you know how to make adjustments. And then you want to check in with them again after the first week and over the first few months. It's really critical in the first 30 to 60 days to make sure you're checking in and keeping a finger on the pulse because that's when they're going to decide whether they're going to be a short-term volunteer for you or transition into becoming a reliable regular. Next slide. Okay, so let's wrap up with talking about how you retain your volunteers and sustain engagement. Next slide. Okay, so Lindy, this is one that requires multiple clicks. Before we talk about how you keep them, let's talk about why volunteers quit, and they do so for one or more of the following reasons. Click. Lack of communication. Click. Unclear expectations. Inadequate training. Asking too much or too little of them. No feedback or appreciation. Little or no flexibility. Don't feel they're making a difference. And lastly, unprofessional environment. Again, most volunteers are signing up for the short term. And if you want to move them into becoming a reliable regular, you have to avoid doing these things. I like to think of the volunteer experience as analogous to online dating. And I'm going to be quick about this because I'm running out of town. But when your volunteer fills out an application and they email you, that's kind of like meeting somebody online, right? And then you agree to meet for coffee. So, because coffee is non-committal. Well, that's what an orientation is. It's non-committal, it's an open house. If that goes well, then you meet for dinner. That's your training. And then if dinner goes well, you go on a few different dates until you, after a few weeks or a few months, you decide that you're going steady. That's when your volunteer becomes a reliable regular. And just like going steady, volunteers will absolutely break up with you months or years after volunteering if you don't appreciate and acknowledge them. So keep that in mind, not just for new volunteers, but for your tenured volunteers as well. Next slide. So quickly, some rules to keep them coming back. Make them feel welcomed. This is about creating a sense of community and a culture of engagement. Service enterprises have a culture of engagement. Move your staff's mentality from us versus them move to a we mentality. And there's a few different ways that you can do this. I'm a fan of name tags for volunteers and t-shirts, so thank you. I see the volunteers here at the conference have t-shirts and name tags, yay. Um, I also like if you have a facility, having them have a place to store their things. My favorite rule for making them feel welcome, it's fast, it's free, it's effective. It's the 10-4 rule, who knows 10-4? All right, I see someone who's a 10-4, quickly. You come within 10 feet of a volunteer, let's even say a staff member or another patron. You make eye contact and you smile or you nod. You're acknowledging that. The four rule, you come within four feet of a volunteer. You not only make eye contact and smile or nod, but just say something. Thanks for coming again today, Lindy. Nice to see you back. Wow, you did such a great job with that adoption the other day. Thank you. You don't have to stop and have a former conversation. You can keep moving, but you're making them feel welcomed. Rule number two, make sure they're prepared. After they get out of training, you want to keep them prepared. If you change policies or procedures to the way you do something, make sure they know that. No one wants to hear, this isn't the way we're doing this, but they were trained to do it that way. Make sure when you have staffing changes, you tell them. If a volunteer is used to working with the same staff member for a year and they're suddenly gone, let them know that in advance. Make them feel prepared. Next slide. Rule number three, give them feedback. Often and always, you want to give feedback as soon as possible. The only two times you don't want to give immediate feedback is if the volunteer or you are highly upset or emotional, or if it's a confidential situation that requires a private conversation. Other than that, always give feedback immediately. The rule of thumb is five to one. For every one constructive piece of feedback you give a volunteer, or redirecting feedback, five positives. That's what the research supports. Try that with your families at home and see how effective that is. If Lindy is always coming to me saying, and the only time she says, I need to speak with you, it's something negative. What am I gonna say when she says, I need to speak with you? What I do now, right? So five positives for every one negative. Try it with your teams, too. Rule number four, give them support. Make sure they know who to go to throughout their tenure with questions and concerns. Make sure you have the right tools and resources. Don't let them stand around. Support them mentally and emotionally, but also support them physically. Anytime you're working with animals, there is an inherent safety risk. 
Keep them safe and protect your brand. Next slide. Communicate impact. Adult learners need to know the reason why. So when you're giving re redirecting feedback, make sure you explain why. Don't use that kitty litter. Some, this was the situation at the sanctuary, but don't use that kitty litter with this one cat. He has allergies. Oh, okay, no problem. Versus don't use that kitty litter. Okay, but why? Um, and communicate impact in the successes you're having. It ties to your mission and it keeps volunteers committed to your cause. And express appreciation. It is not the high ticket items. It's not throwing the expensive party once a year and offering plaques and trophies. The research shows what volunteers really want is the little things. Appreciation, acknowledgement, communication of impact, letting them know they're making a difference and you can't do it without them. Next slide. Don't waste their time. We talked about this one before. Please be ready to receive them and keep them busy. Rule number eight, give them opportunities for growth. And that is for tenured as well as skilled volunteers. Make sure that they can move through your organization. Rule number nine, ask for feedback and ideas. Just like you should give them feedback, you should ask them for feedback. What form do you want that feedback? In person, survey, or email? Make sure you communicate the process. Volunteers don't always get a vote in your organization, but they should have a voice. And then rule number 10, periodically reassess your needs. As your organization and your volunteer program grows, your needs are gonna change. So we reassess our volunteer opportunities once a year at Best Friends. I would suggest you do that as well. Next slide. Okay, so in summary, as Frances Hesselbein says, without a disciplined and respectful approach to recruitment, orientation, support, assessment, and recognition, we will have lower performance and a disenchanted volunteer. And he is absolutely correct. So I know what I'm asking you to do takes a tremendous amount of time and effort, but if you do it, you will be successful. So to summarize, three key takeaways. Number one, sometimes you have to slow down in order to go fast. Assess where your volunteer program currently stands and decide how you want to do things differently to move your mission forward. Number two, if you build it, they will come. Build a solid, well-rounded program for your volunteers with a great infrastructure. They'll not only come, but they will stay and periodically reassess their, your needs. And then lastly, communicate gratitude and impact in everything you do with volunteers. They need to know that they are appreciated and that they are making a difference. Move from the us versus them to the culture of engagement and we. So with that, I thank you for your time and happy volunteering.